So we're going to now move on to our first panel. This is exciting. And I get to, yeah, I get to introduce our first moderator of the day. Film critic Elvis Mitchell is the host. Yeah, bring it on. He's the host of KCRW's nationally syndicated pop culture and entertainment show, The Treatment. He has served as film critic for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, LA Weekly, Detroit Free Press, and the New York Times, and as a pop culture commentator for Weekend Edition on NPR. Mitchell has also served as editor-at-large at Spin Magazine and is a special correspondent for Interview Magazine. In 2008, the interview show Elvis Mitchell, Under the Influence, began airing on Turner Classic Movies. He's a visiting lecturer at Harvard, producer and co-creator of the NAACP Image Award-winning documentary, The Blacklist, the curator for the film independent program at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and a film scholar at the University of Nevada. Please give a warm welcome for Elvis Mitchell. I don't have any poems from Lakes and Hughes, so please forgive me. I'm very sorry. Instead, what we'll do is talk about something that is very much a part of Los Angeles, and that is the Amazon series Buck. <laughs> now in its fourth season, the sharply written addictive crime procedural has many stars. From versatile and charismatic lead actor Titus Welliver and other accomplished cast members to Michael Connelly internationally best-selling, award-winning author who executive produces a show based on his enormously popular character. The irreverently crazy <laughs> LAPD homicide detective Harry Bosch, I think better known as Hieronymus Bosch. Don't forget that name, it's very important. Uh, and LA, a character in its own right. Learn what it takes to make Connolly's novels into this fast-moving, location-centric series as it moves through the seats of LA the streets of LA. So let's take a look at a clip from the fourth season. In a civil society, racism has no part of justice. Torture has no part of justice. You know that there were a thousand police killings in America last year? Do you have any idea how many cops were convicted of murder or manslaughter? None. Elias, the famous civil rights attorney known for taking on police brutality cases, has been murdered. Man ruined a lot of careers. It is essential we clear this case quickly. Let the chips fall where they may. Unholy war. Help you with something? Nah, I made a help. But the cops killed Mr. Elias. Why? Because my lawyer was gonna prove what they did. The mayor is concerned this is recipe for a riot. If we get this wrong, the city could explode. Even if we get it right. It's lose lose for you, Harry. Either piss off the department or the whole city. Let redemption keep you warm. Where are you on your mother's homicide? Still grinding on my time. Spoke with Bradley Walker this morning. You've been trying to get in his head. That cold case you're working on. Can I be of any help? When I think you can. You can be sure I'll reach out to you. A task force led by Harry Bosch. This is the white man you think is going to drill down to the truth? I do. Past lives just catch up with us. Yeah, change who we are. Cops did this. But if any police officer who might have had reason to cause your father harm did it, that's a killer, not a cop. So you better run. Secrets come out at some time. Maybe it's your time. Much, much better. Thank you. Please help me welcome to the stage creator and executive producer Michael Connolly. <laughs> executive producer Henry Batson. Batson, I'm sorry. Star Titus Oliver, his daughter Madison Lynch, and Paul Schreiber, location manager, supervising location manager for the show. How's it going? 
Henrik, Titus, Madison, of course, Paul, and Michael. It's karaoke time. <laughs> What's your jam? How do you get down over here? Uh, Backstabbers by the OJs. <laughs> Music, please. Should we do the moves? I got it going for you. Here you go. Are you ready? <laughs> Uh, Michael, if I can, since we're talking about L.A. as a character, start with you because two of the obvious influences of the character are two L.A. movies that basically say good intentions are meaningless. The Long Goodbye in Chinatown. Yeah, if I had to um, list my two favorite movies, it would be those two. Uh, I don't know in what order, but um, yeah, I guess they're very, um, very noir in their... Uh, sensibilities about Los Angeles, but on the, on the story, I mean, as you go through that story, you, you uh, get a good sense of uh, the city in those times. But also, again, it's interesting because we talk about L.A. as a character, and so much noir, L.A. is a character, as a city that can't be trusted. It's a, a place of secrets and lies and self-interest, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I boil it all down to is the place that occasionally you got to look over your shoulder, see what's behind you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, it's a beautiful place, but it has that, that kind of um, sensibility. When, you know, when the first week I got a job at the LA Times back in 80, 87 or 86, I can't remember, my editor said it's a sunny place for shady people. And I think that's, <laughs> that's, that's been a very apt description. You want to chime in on that, Henrik? Because <laughs> it's kind of the case, isn't it? Well, it sounded like he described uh, the business we're in, but uh, it's kind of <laughs> one, of the one of the same, I guess. But uh, let's talk about that, too, because, again, that idea of L.A. being, and I want you to jump on this, if you would, Titus, as well, L.A. being a completely untrustworthy place. Um, is Each season, just when you think that Bosch is kind of just basically uprooted with every rat there is, there's another one that turns up. Yeah, I think... The sh sh one of the things, just as Michael's book, he's been writing about this character for almost 20 years, and one of the things that we wanted to bring in is that, you know, when I read a, uh, one of Michael's book is, you know the foundation, you know the city, you know the character, but everything is slightly changing, and I think LA is a very much a city that is always evolving. There, it's never, LA is never gonna be fully cooked. It's, you know, gentrification, but then there's new neighborhoods that springs up that comes with, Everything there is, crime, prosperity, everything. And that's, that's the city, and that's the city Harry lives in. And he's, you know, I think he and the city are, are one uh, to, to, to a big extent and kind of like mirror each other. Do you feel that way too, Tennis? Yeah, and I, one of the great things about being in Los Angeles, obviously, and rather than being in Atlanta or in Vancouver and CGing everything in the background is that there is a pulse to this city and that kind of informs so many uh, aspects of production for us. We can go to Angel's Flight and shoot at Angel's Flight. Which is a really breathtaking location. It really is. And there's, it, the crew, they always, um, it should be a bumper sticker or a shirt, but they go, oh, the places Harry takes us. Because he doesn't work, we're never in Santa, rarely are we in Santa Monica. You know, we're in Boyle Heights, we're in, all these places where that are that are the dark and dreary part of it. You know, I mean, it's that whole sort of analogy that you know, here is L.A. It's palm trees and sunshine. It's beautiful, and the facade, you know, the whole veneer, social veneer of this place is beauty and prosperity and opportunity, and yet scratch an inch below the surface, and it's very dark. And it is, you know, it's the city of broken dreams for a lot of people. So. That kind of, uh, you know, tonally informs the show, I think. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, I don't want you to get too much away, Paul, but there's a, a climactic location in the very last episode of this season that literally is all these things that Titus is talking about. Can you talk about how you found that place? Well, you're talking about the tunnels. Yes. Yeah. The subway terminal building, underneath it, there are tunnels that uh, serviced the subway lines. And just research, basically, in terms of, of how to uncover it. And then uh, um, Michael has a, a friend, associate John Wellborn, who was very involved with uh, uh, Angel's Flight and ran the foundation for many years. I think, actually, he's still on the board. Um, he helped to hook us up with it. Um, and it hadn't been filmed for a very, very long time. 
Um, it's actually uh, increasing quite a bit in its uh, frequency of, of film shoots. Um, right now, I, I, not necessarily because of us, I don't think, but uh, um, I think the building saw certain marketing abilities and, and obviously the, the, there's money involved. Um, but uh, that's basically the gist of the tunnels. Um, and it, geographically, how it comes together is really, it was staggering how well it worked for our story. Um, it was fascinating watching it all evolve over the course of the season. Not fascinating. Shooting. <laughs> Three stories below Los Angeles. Where Very different. With you, little can, you can sort of smell it from your laptop. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. The air no, scrubbers and... Well, what he was saying, I mean, it was kind of amazing. We, in the storyline, we had to, Harry had to try to find a way underground from the Biltmore to uh, Angel Sight, and Paul was like, Harry, he actually found the real way, yeah. and we got to film in it. <laughs> and and the, um, the only thing I lament is it looks so cool and forbidding and beautiful at the same time that I'm thinking, ah, they're gonna think we green screened this or something, and it's and it's really there. Uh oh, no, it wasn't no. green screen. <laughs> uh -uh. There are a lot of how best to put this picturesque look <laughs> that you guys use, and and we were just talked before we sat down here, Paul, and obviously from looking at the show, it looks like it's about 80 percent location because there are only a couple standing sets, right? It's certainly more than less is out on location, yeah. um, and that's just. Detectives, they don't spend a whole lot of time in one place. They go all over, all over the place. And uh, our home at Red Studios, and any show, there's a, a limit to the amount of stage space that you can have. So yeah, in general, for, and, and given the way our scripts go, very frequently it's not a particularly long scene that takes place at location X, Y, or Z. So it just doesn't make economic sense to build it or create it. It's generally always wiser to go out on location and, and get it. So we have days where we're out on location, we pop to three or four different locations. Um, and it's, it's good when the crew can travel light, which doesn't always happen because we have so many different kinds of uh, circumstances, whether it's daylight, just so many different kinds of lighting uh, differences uh, over the course of one day with four different locations. They gotta always have so much equipment and stuff. So it's, it's challenging on the crew Plus as well. His trailer's like a half a block yeah, long. Yeah, see, I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say, Madison, have you ever shot Yeah, it's stage? blue and it says uh, Johnny Pot or something. <laughs> uh, that's my trailer. No, like, have you ever shot on stage on the show? Is everything you do on oh. location? No, I've done, my room has been on the stage. Oh, okay. oh yeah. Um, By the way, clean that room up, will you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a mess. Well, thank you for joining the conversation, Madison. Um, <laughs> let me ask you, what are your feelings about Maddie over the years? I mean, because she's changed so much, and she's, but she's always been like the adult in that relationship with her father, hasn't she? Yeah, I mean, I'm really fond of the relationship that um, you know, Harry and Maddie have, and I think it's really interesting and entertaining and it, a pleasure to play, <laughs> I must say. Um, just watching how she is you know, sometimes the more sensible one of, Almost always of the, the two more sensible one. parents. Um, you know, how she rags on her mom for not being able to cook and never having any food in the house. It's, it's really fun to play because I, I often, you know, do the same thing with my dad. You know, when I'm home in Atlanta, which is where I, I grew up, I will call my dad up like, hey, I have some, some soup, some leftover soup that I got from this restaurant. Do you want it? Okay, all right. I'll bring it home. <laughs> But you, it's interesting you're talking about both parents because this season you have a particularly tough thing to play. And I'm not going to give it away for people who haven't seen it, but I just wanted to ask you because it, and you really rise to the challenge as an actress, so congratulations for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but to not give it away, but again, there's a scene in the last episode where you get a chance to sort of deal with your mother by looking at a piece of video and your reaction time with it. Just talk about your character over this last season, how much she, she, she really grows up this year. Yeah, it was an honor to be able to, to play that. You know, the writing was amazing. Um, so I, I owe it all to them, first and foremost, you know, to be able to work with such amazing actors and to be able to portray such an amazing story. I just, I feel so honored. So, um, yeah. Um, it was definitely darker stuff to play, but I really love to do that because it allows for more dimension and character development. So I, I 
it filled my actress soul to be able to do <laughs> this season. I really, really enjoyed it, even though it was hard. Well, I want to ask you two types because it's so interesting, and, and Michael as well, you guys, that in the books, that we are basically inside Harry's head most of the time. But what, what makes the show so interesting is that we really get a chance to see Harry from other points of view. And it's almost like every season, Harry's kind of a different guy because we're seeing somebody else look at him. This season, we're following John Getz looking at him. Right. But I just wonder if that feels different for you in some way, Ty. It's just because, again, we do get a chance to see Harry from another point of view in each season. Well, I, I, I feel like Harry's a guy whose evolution as a human being, for the most part, he's, pre, he's pretty formed. And um, so he, I don't see that we, he doesn't necessarily evolve individually, but he evolves within the circumstances that he's placed. And to sort of speak to the, um, through the eyes of those who are observing him, um, that's a great way for us to sort of um, project and or inform the audience. And we kind of, we initially had attacked that in, in the first season uh, how, in the way to how do we inform the audience of some of Harry's backstory and bring them in. And it was a, a really, really interesting thing because we, we wanted to, Harry's a, a former Special Forces operator and we kind of wanted to get that out, but because Harry is a guy who hangs back and is not one to necessarily, you don't want to have a scene where he goes, by the way, I was in the Special Forces. Um, <laughs> That's fine if it's T.J. Hooker, but it, it, wouldn't, <laughs> it wouldn't work for this. And so how would we get that information? And so it was a great little mechanism of having Money Chandler in, in the cross-examination of him in the civil case where she asked him, how many people have you killed? And he says, I don't know. And she says, well, gee, you, know, you, you must know. And he says, no, I, I don't. I was in the military. And she says, well, what? Uh, and he says, well, the Army. Infantry? And he says, no, Special Forces. We have all that information in a four-line exchange. Now we kind of, we know who we're dealing with. And Michael and Eric and all involved in, in the breaking down of those stories have done that really masterfully by either mechanisms like that or in the process of observation. We find Harry a lot of times alone in his house or at his desk or on, on his deck, you know, being contemplative. And there's no dialogue because that narrative is expressed in the written word in the books. But how do you translate that? And so, you know, kudos to the, the creative genius of, of these guys that are able to, to translate that into stuff that's actable but also can be absorbed by, by the audience. You asked me what time it is. I told you how to make a watch, but that's... No, no, I like watches in TJ Hooker. We can talk about this all day long. But uh, Michael, I wanted to get to that for you too because th that's such a great way to sort of make this guy make sense. It also makes a way to really kind of change in some respects the, the amp that we see. We are learning about Harry through the way other people see him. And that's, that seems to me to be such a smart way to sort of crack the difference between doing a book and doing a, uh, a narrative for another medium. Yeah, as you said, the books are in his head, and it's a cheat to the reader of books if you don't know who Harry is, you know, because you're in his thoughts. And so when we, that's, that's the ride that I've loved about this show, is that not only are we telling these stories again in different ways, we're actually correcting stuff that I regret in the books, and so we get to tell it again, tell it better. Uh, I'm sorry, you can't just like glide over the speed bump. <laughs> The stuff you want to well, correct? No, just like I think in the books, especially the early books, there's a lot of characters that when they turn sideways, they disappear. There's just no depth to them, and we've given them. That feels like the Marlowe over to me. You're kind of like racing through and identifying people, and they feel less noirish and more about Harry as the books go on. Yeah, I mean, but an example is Jerry Edgar. Um, in the book books, there's not a lot to him, and, and we got a lot going with him now. That's just one example. Um, but, but going back to the original question, just going into the, the stories and, and knowing that we have to find a way of taking these internal thoughts and somehow transmitting them. From early on, Eric Overmeyer, um, the showrunner, 
you know, said that's our biggest challenge. How do we reveal, like you said, I'm in the military. You don't want Harry going like, boy, I've had a tough life, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but you got you, you to gotta find somebody who can present, hey, I think this guy had a tough life or this guy's carrying some stuff inside. So casting was a key thing. So we're just kind of trading these wonderful compliments. But, you know, when we found Titus, we knew we had a guy that could take us off the hook. We didn't have to. But he's also the guy you always wanted, wasn't he? Not to uh, sort of make another watch out of something here, but yeah. No, well, he was in the, I threw his name out. I am very proud of that. I'm, I'm Mr. No Experience in TV and uh, very timidly said, what about Titus Welver? And uh, he ends up getting the job, so I feel pretty cool about that. But. <laughs> But it was Me too. But it was because <laughs> it was because I could see another uh, uh, roles he had played that he can carry something inside and not even say a word, and you know it's there. You know there's some damage or something uh, behind the eyes, some torture and so forth. And uh, that's what I wanted because uh, Eric drilled into me that we have to find somebody who can project a lot of the stuff that you say in the books and we can't say. You gonna say something? Here? No. Okay, because I was gonna ask you quickly, Paul. Since we're talking about L.A., I mean, you just gave me a pretty, you and Peter just gave me a pretty interesting nugget about the location for Harry's house. Yeah, the the thing about houses, especially in the the Hollywood Hills with views, they you walk in and there's a big living room there, and there's the big kitchen there, and the great room, and all these spaces are so involved and large and speak about the person that lives there. The beautiful thing about Harry's house, which I had nothing to do with, I did not do the pilot. Um, Peter Jan Brugge uh, used the house on heat and it was quite a hunt, as I understand it, to find that house. The house is not very big and it doesn't say a whole lot about a home. It's so small, literally, the, the whole living room and dining room, maybe a little bit bigger than, than this part of the stage, a little bit. And it, it provides the focus to be on the person, the character, and the view in the city, because that's really all this house is. It's glass on two sides and not much else and the stories and the character fill it in and they give it life and uh, the city obviously just saturates it um, to no end. It's a remarkable space to be in. It's a joy, really, every time we go up there. And a nightmare to shoot. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say. <laughs> talk about, talk about yeah, it's a joy. <laughs> talk when it's 100 that. degrees and... <laughs> no, but, but, but it is one of those fantastic places to everything Paul said is true and you know being a big fan of Michael's book in the real it's weird we have two Bosch worlds the real world is what I call the Bosch books world uh, the house is actually on the other side of the hill looking out over um, the valley versus we have the Hollywood but I remember when we were shooting the pilots the um, excellent crew had dressed it up put it up and I went up with Michael and Petey on Brugge and we went up there and I walked in for the first time and it was like walking into that book. It was that, that feeling. And we you know, sat down on the deck and was like, this is gonna be great. And so, so it has everything. So it is worth how complicated it is to shoot there because it's literally at the very top of uh, Blue Jay Drive, right? Blue Jay Blue Way. Way. Blue Jay Way. So it's this one Not a Beatles road. fan up. Actually, Blue Heights. Blue Heights. Blue, yes. Uh, no, so it takes a good 20 minutes to get up there. If you forgot something, it's 20 minutes down. And, and <laughs> you have three parking spaces, so everything has to be brought up, and we have loads of equipment. We have cranes, and, you know, it, it is a full-scale maneuver to get up there and shoot, but it's worth it every time. You couldn't build this on set and get the same feeling. Um, and, you know, we try to plan it production-wise smartly um, to not go back up there too many times, but <laughs> it's worth it. That's the long st uh, short of it. No, but talk to you about, because uh, again, this show is so location heavy, and one of the things I love about the show is it actually celebrates all the different parts of Los Angeles. It doesn't seek to glamorize it. The parts that are beautiful are beautiful. Yeah. The parts that are not are not, but yeah. it's not trying to say that LA is a uniform experience. And so much of TV and film as you guys all know, tries to make LA 
this monolithic experience, but Bosch is very different about that, isn't it? Yeah, I think, as I said in the beginning, LA is so many things. It is not one thing and the show has to be there. And I think that was also in the first season we said, let's, let's not go, what was it, west of um, La Cienega? or something like that. Let's try to stay out of Venice and Santa Monica and all that and really portray Hollywood and, and East LA. And I think the Hollywood sign over five se or four seasons has only been seen once and that is the, in the pilots. Yeah, right, the reservoir. Yeah, that, that's, mm -hmm. that's that once. Um, and the rest is the LA that we, you know, all who live in the city on a day-to-day -day basis, when you go to job, when you go to the convenience store, you go somewhere, you know, off the beaten track, that's the LA that we live in, and that's what we portray. Well, in this current season too, just to go back to that for a second, uh, because it's maybe an easier reach for some people, you get a real sense of how different all of downtown LA is. Mm -hmm. I mean, even just that part of the city mm -hmm. is so many different things, isn't it? Yeah, it's um, ranging from this season that was very, in these great architectural buildings, Bradbury, uh, Biltmore Hotel, Angels Flight, all this, and season before we were shooting on Skid Row. That's literally five blocks away, and it's it's, two opposite world. It's really wealth against the poorest of the poorest of that city, which is, again, that's Los Angeles. Um, and that's the books, and that's Harry Bosch's world. Well, the thing, I, I just I don't mean to harp on this, but the thing that's so key to this, this show is you get a sense of how big Los Angeles is, which if you've never been here before, you don't know until you right. get here that it's like a planet. Yeah. And, and the show really gives you a sense of it. it's a a sprawl in a way that, I mean, geographically, you can almost feel sometimes the character's kind of getting lost in all the size of the city, can't you? Yeah, it's, again, <laughs> it's, it's a nightmare from logistics to shoot uh, because you really have to f go vast, vast distances. Um, but that's also the beauty, it's a palette. Um, you really, this year we were up um, shooting a lot in um, the Glendale area. Um, and we've been, you know, down in Long Beach and, you know, we really try to, where, where the case takes Harry, we, instead of cheating it and, hey, can we shoot a beach segment here that should be Long Beach, like we can take that down in Venice. No, let's go to Long Beach. Let's make the effort. The, uh, there's a line in this, it's said a couple times uh, in the show this season, it goes where it goes. And that's kind of like the uh, motto of the writing room. Yeah. I probably should not reveal that in front of Paul, oh but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, um, he'll be getting the season five outline soon, and then he won't want to sit next to me again. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, we feel we have a feel an obligation. I mean, we're in our we're writing our fifth season, and we we want to cover this community. By the time we're done, how many seasons that is, we want to feel that we didn't leave anything out. And, Can you see uh, it going in, in sort of real times? It's the same span that the books go? I mean, because it's obviously a different thing. He was a Vietnam vet in the first book, but would you like to see it go, uh, run a, have a 10-year or 20-year run? Oh, of course, but, um, <laughs> and I don't think we'll run out of material because I continue to write books, and, and, and they, there's no obligation to use books. We've just done it so far, but we can, whenever we want to. Oh, know, is that a conversation to depart from the books for one of the seasons? Are you thinking about that for maybe next season? Possibly. Uh, I'm not the showrunner. I mean, it, it, I'm involved in those kind of discussions, and I've never held out that you got to do a book. Um, actually, technically, the deal was the first three seasons should be based on books, and but now we're in our fifth, and we're basing it on a book still. So um, it's it's always uh, up for discussion. Bosch in space. <laughs> That's right. I want to do that one. Well, you were kind of in the black hole in that last episode, but that's another conversation. <laughs> uh, Matt, let me ask you, what would, do you remember your audition for the show, what that was like, what you did? Yeah, I, I got off easy, you guys. <laughs> Acting, okay, so the audition process to book a role is like tumultuous, horrible, would not recommend it. Um, but I, I booked this role off of a tape from Atlanta. Uh -huh. It was like maybe a minute long. I sent it over, and at the time, I was like, uh, very young, I can't, I'm not gonna do the math. But I had- Four, four years ago, you were very young. Okay. Yeah, very well, young. <laughs> because <laughs> cause you, you've, you've aged beautifully. Let Thank me tell you. you that now. <laughs> Thank you so much. She's got a good surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and at the time when I booked, well, when I had heard that they had, they were interested in me, I had front row seat tickets to One Direction. 
<laughs> and it really was, is a sign of how young you are. You just gave the game yeah, away. Yeah, I gave it away. It, and it was going to conflict. And so I was like, oh, no. <laughs> this is the worst. And I booked it. And I was like, this is even worse. Like, I, I want a job, obviously. And this is great. But One Direction. <laughs> and um, my mom, she... <laughs> she <laughs> ended up um, getting me front row seat tickets that were even better than my old ones in New Orleans before I had to go to LA to shoot. So it worked out perfect. You didn't know that? Yeah, she, you talked about that incessantly when we first met. Huh. I'm really happy to be here, but I, I had One Direction tickets. <laughs> Which were, I think, actually our five tickets, if we want to be true. No, no, no. Is that no. how you guys bonded, Titus, over your love of One Direction? Is that where no, she said One together? Direction, and I said, what are you talking about? I had no, I mean, I, I have a 12-year-old daughter who listened to One Direction for, for a little bit. I, I sorry. I, I've never heard that story, but I, I, maybe it's irony, but Maddie is kind of inspired by my own, my own daughter, and she has had one ro first row tickets to the One Direction. <laughs> Just we to give you a context. We won't point her out in the audience. Well, just to give you context, this is the longest One Direction conversation I've ever I had know. in my entire life. <laughs> um, let's but, move on. Yes, yes, let's please move on. But since you brought up uh, your own daughter, and, and at a certain point, you know, Maddie becomes, uh, not to give too much away, but I was wondering if there's some thought about maybe using some of that stuff in the books, or Maddie becomes involved in her father's life in a much deeper, more interesting way for future seasons. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, we're uh, we we're we're working out to season five, and uh, in season four, Maddie gets accepted to Chapman University and goes where my daughter happens to go. <laughs> and um, so we're building season five, so it's during the summer, so she can be home, and she's going to um, be an intern with a law enforcement agency. I won't mention, and and she she'll get involved. So it will. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering, going to ask you too, Titus, your, your reaction to the, the first book after you read it. What did you think of Harry as a character? Well, I had read a book prior to getting the, the script for the show. I had read a book many, many, many years ago, one of, the, one of the earlier books, and I had enjoyed it and thought to myself at the time, I've got to read more of these books. There weren't that many. At, at, Michael hadn't written that many at the time. So when I read the script for Bosch, um, it was just one of those scripts, and you know they they don't come along all that often. Where I can usually tell within ten pages or less if it's something that's going to interest me. The, I read the script so quickly, and then closed it, and then opened it back up and read it, and and it became one of those actors' curses where you read something and you immediately connect so strongly with the material, but then. You know, because it is the sea of heartbreak, you don't want to become too invested. Now, I mean, when I say that, you go in and you do the best you can in the meeting and the room, and, and then it's kind of out of your hands. But I, I, I had this visceral response to reading that script and just thinking, I couldn't write a character on my own better than Harry Bosch. And I, and I, and I knew who this guy was. Sort of me. So then I, I said to Mike, well, which books, because we were on the fast track, which books should I read? And Mike sent all of the books that had been, <laughs> that's not a complaint. By the way, they're signed in their first edition, so <laughs> they, they, they have a very hallowed, respected place on my bookshelf. But so I read the books that we were using for that season. But my experience was in, in reading, the book, I was lying in bed because I like to read at night. I can't read Mike's books at home in bed because I, I didn't go to sleep until 3 o'clock in the morning because I couldn't stop reading the book. So I can only read the books, and I've now read them all on an airplane or on a beach where I'm uninterrupted because I don't want to be bothered, and I can't, I can't put them down. Maybe it's, maybe it's OCD or whatever, but it's all, I, I blame it on the literary judo of Connolly. Um, <laughs> Well, we almost didn't get him because he had front row seats to the OJ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> were they were they opening for One Direction? Was it bringing the generations together? Oh, no. hold, hold on, Elvis. That's that's sacrilegious now. <laughs> Titus, she can hear you. She's right I know. here. <laughs> oh. Thank, well, she's she's out of that phase now. I guess that could could sort of speak to to go back to the question and the. Um, the evolution of the relationship between Harry and Maddie, but also the evolution of the relationship between Madison and Titus, in that coming in, we didn't really, it, there was, it, it was kind of, you know, fresh ground, and we sort of had to create that thing, and, and what we discovered um, <laughs> was that uh, we were very comfortable with each other, um, we have we have fun together, but we you know we're serious when we do our work. But that when we got to this season, we both I remember sitting in the in the makeup trailer, kind of looking at each other and going, "It's uh, that's a big pot we got in front of us." And um, that experience um, was just kind of unfolded, and the the end result. This is me again going on just about Madison. I got to see, to be an actor, to be an older actor, an elder statesman, to, to see um, an actor like Madison um, mature intellectually and artistically and, and be a witness to that and have the privilege to participate in that, for me, was probably the most rewarding thing of the entire season and actually in all four seasons was to watch that because I didn't have that experience but to, to, to see it in real time was a mind blower. And I would say things to Madison and she would go, yeah. <laughs> I go, no, 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 it's really, it was, that was amazing. Uh, thanks. Are we, are they having pizza tonight? Oh. Are they? <laughs> anyway. Would you get a respond to that? Oh, yeah, she does. <laughs> um, all I'm going to say is I am very blessed to be able to work with such amazing actors, such veterans. And I don't mean that in like the sense that you're old, but like in the sense <laughs> that yeah. you've been oh, around. Yeah, you do. you've, you've done so much. And I just am really, it's really, it's good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you came for office. Yeah. That was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to ask you, Paul, since we're talking about the books, are the books often the source for you of inspiration for finding locations, and if not an actual place, then something to evoke the kind of spirit of what? Because you do have both a resource of the scripts for the show and the books. The, the, the scripts trump the books. No, of course, but I just wonder, yeah, in addition to that. For sure. Just, uh, you know, it's... It, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For my hunt. For my we'll mail hunt. you your check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we draw on the scripts. Um, the, the, frequently, they'll write specifically what they want, whether it's at the farmer's market or Grand Central Market or whatever it is, because Michael's books are so specific. Uh, sorry, specific. Bosch drives down Laurel Canyon, then he made a write on Moore Park. There's very specific things. And we try to stick to that. And in terms of what Henrik was saying, um, we try to go to the real places. Um, there's a, a, a word, there's two words that I have hanging up in my office. Uh, ver verisimilitude and interstitial. And we draw on those as much as we possibly can. Um, so that's really what, what drives it, the characters. If, it's a certain socionomic makeup. We try to go to those neighborhoods. Um, we spent a, a good chunk of time in the San Gabriel Valley this past season um, with uh, Chinese um, restaurants and, and other Chinese worlds. Um, and we, we go to them, and it's that reality that really gives a credibility. To this morning, for no particular reason, I saw this little interview uh, with Sean Connery, um, and it was, someone asked him the difference between his uh, James Bond and Roger Moore's, and 
his, his response was that he draws, his role was drawing upon the credible. The, the, the credible. Um, and Rogers Moore's, it started changing into a little more of the gimmicks and things. We tried to stay very, very credible to the case and the direction of the case. It goes where it goes, and that's generally tr how we try to scout. It doesn't always make logistical sense, but oh well. Hence, <laughs> Bosch in space. <laughs> that's one thing we got to add. We should add the LAPD. The LAPD yeah. has been so sure. accommodating to us. Were they fans of the books before the show even started to go? Yeah. Were they what? Were they fans of the books before the show started to go? Some, well, some of them were, I think. But um, yeah, the, the cooperation they've given us is amazing. Like, we built an interior Hollywood station, but we film all the time at the real one. We film at the headquarters downtown. We film in the real lab. And, you know, we have two um, active LAPD homicide detectives who are consultants in the writing room, consultants to Paul, consultants everywhere. They're on set as well um, to help us do procedure right. And uh, I think that has really added to the show um, the access they've gotten us to things. Um, are we doing audience questions here? I thought that's, are we? Okay. I guess the answer to that would be yes. Yes, we are. Um, like if you have a question, because I'm sort of blinded here or else I'm having a stroke. Um, <laughs> if you have a question, if you can stand, there's a microphone right, oh. Oh, thank you. Hi, uh, I think the show is amazing for its authenticity, you know, in terms of the locations. The other day I, I drove past Angel's Flight and I felt like I spotted a movie star in Beverly Hills. It was um, not very exciting. But anyway, the question about the diversity, uh, both uh, when you're on location and in the loca and um, the casting there, are, are these working together? Because it doesn't seem like you call uh, central casting. The casting is very authentic all the way around, and I think that's uh, remarkable as well. It's organic and it's uh, seamless. Well, first off, thank you. Uh, and I think just as everything else we've talked about up here, we try to be true. And if you look at this room, this is kind of how LA looks. It's a mix of every people. So if we would stray from that, that authentic, authentic can't speak. Authenticity, uh, I'm Swedish from the beginning, that's, that's why I'm sounding so weird. See, but if I said that, you would get so pissed. <laughs> if you're there are a lot of Swedish jokes. All the time, and Henrik Thanks. is very sensitive, but he just, he just threw that one out there. Sorry, go ahead. So we tried to get a lot of Swedes in the show, that's yeah, what I'm saying? Right. No. Well, that's what makes you diverse, good point, yes, yeah. men and women. Yeah, no, but we tried to, in all areas, from ranging from police procedural works to how an autopsy works to how people look and what food they eat, it goes back to that. We wanna portray the real LA and the real city and you know, who we are as people who inhabits this great city. That's a very, very, very big portion of it. So that's, I think, is the answer to that. It's just we're trying to do it right. And we are a very diverse city. Is there another question? Yeah. Uh, one. Okay. Uh, hi, I absolutely love the show. Uh, and to answer your question, yeah, they do hire through Central Casting. I did background on one episode. <laughs> <laughs> I had to show up. I love the show. Thank you. <laughs> Um, one aspect of the show that I absolutely love um, after the little beginning part is the title sequence. I love the horn and everything like that and the clips from the different aspects of the city. I see you included uh, Angel's Flight in it. I just wanted to know how did the title sequence come together, if you guys know that. Yes. Uh, it's, um, we re reached out. Eric Overmeyer, who's been our showrunner, had worked with um, a production company. And now I'm blinking on their name. Um, that done the opening credits for Treme, a show he worked with. Um, so we sat with, down with them and, you know, it was a spitball back and forth, but uh, Imaginary Forces, uh, really great guys. And then we shot specific footage for them to use and they also draw some um, from, from, the, um, from the first season that we did. Uh, and then we tried to update it. I think this year we put in some new material from Angel's Flight. Yeah, the car pulling off. Yeah, the car pulling off. So, but it was Imaginary Forces, really great guys, and we had a blast doing it. But that song came from an Amazon um, promo, and we heard that and said, let's put that song over this. Um, That's yeah, and uh, there was a little bit of dispute among some of us, but it ultimately was chosen and it's, it's pretty, pretty catchy, pretty good. Now, 
<laughs> now it's Overmeyer's ringtone on his cell phone. <laughs> he was the one who didn't like it. That's what that was the subtext of the joke. <laughs> you know me, I like to be on the nose. I know. <laughs> He's Swedish, he doesn't Can know. Can you say that's that's the text of the joke? <laughs> yeah, there's another question. Because I can't tell if there's a question. Yes, over here, yes. Hi, big fan of the books as well as the TV show. I had a question for Michael. In the books, you, you do, like the TV show, you go all over the city. When you're writing it, do you, do you go out and you kind of experience different locations, you try and find different ones, or are you writing from your own experience? Because you have sandwich shops on Los Feliz Boulevard, you go all over the valley. Where do you find the inspiration for them? Yeah, I do a lot of physical research. Um, I like to... Um as seen, visually seen a place or, or hung out there before I write about it. And that's just kind of a routine I've found. Uh, what's been interesting to me is that the show goes everywhere, like Paul was saying, I think this year, went from all the way down to Borrego Springs, out to Monterey Park, up into the valley. Um, and I see places while I'm traveling with the show or on, on set that I've now turned around put into books. Because um, my book will come out before the season, so people will think I found these places. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's, it's we, your show. We've destroyed business at Dupar's at the farmer's market. Nobody goes there anymore. Uh, yes, we're, that's true. We're being true. sued. Nobody uh, goes there anymore because <laughs> you do. Yeah, thank you for that. I actually went there a few weeks ago, and I was going under the little Cajun place. Oh, yeah, sure. The, the there, and, pot. And, yeah, and, <laughs> and a couple of people, when they saw me, they... They got a little nervous. <laughs> they, so we're expecting to see two guys on a motorcycle. I'm, I'm, I, I hesitate to say anything because I don't know how many people have seen the entire season. Yeah, don't, please don't give Spoiler away. alert. Yes. Another question here? Um, yeah. Hey, uh, can, can we all swap business cards? You know, you know, because I mean, I, I want to come up there and you know, just you know, talk a little bit, but it's, it's kind of detailed. I don't want to get into it right here because we're asking questions. Can we like swap business cards? Um, I, don't I don't have a business card. I, yeah. A lot of people don't, but I can okay. take notes. Yeah. Well, okay, if you let's see if we can get a question that doesn't involve right. yeah. you know any sort of ritual card swapping of cards. <laughs> um, another question because yeah. here we go. All right. Well, first of all, Titus, uh, loved it when you maced Val Kilmer. <laughs> oh, that, thank, yes, that's sweet. Um, I, one thing I really love about this show is uh, the, the wealth of really, really good um, supporting characters you have, like Chief Irving, who's not even a supporting character. He's a, practically a lead character. And you had Bradley Walker, and you have the mayor. But I want more Crate and Barrel. <laughs> I mean, these guys are just terrific. They are wonderful characters. When is Bosch going to go out with Crate and Barrel and do something? Because they always have a one-liner, they always have the off-cuff remark, and then, oh, and here's the critical information you were looking for. They're just great characters. Thanks. Do you represent Troy and Craig by any uh, chance? <laughs> no, but if we can swap business cards, I'll yeah, offer yeah. to. <laughs> no, we'll see you at the One Direction show and swap cards there. <laughs> You guys, well, you want to talk about that a little bit? Because that, that life from, the, from those guys. No, yeah, the, the comic, the, it's, it's little moments, but they're funny moments, and they just seem to come at the right time. And when, you, when you're in the middle of this, and you're writing this stuff, and then you film it, you don't necessarily see it. But when I've watched that sh this season, for example, with family members who have not seen the show, and they just burst out laughing at something those guys did, it's kind of like, I, I'm part of the show, and it's like, well, I didn't see that coming. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, but they, they're, they're subtle, and they just have great timing. Well, let's thank these guys for being here, and thank you guys so much.